Hello, everyone, and welcome to VMs End to End, where we are talking about using virtual machines, Google Compute Engine, with different services and tools. Um, today, we are going to be talking about Kubernetes. And we are lucky to have Kaslin Fields here to join us. Welcome, Kaslin. Hello, and thank you for having me. I'm always excited to be on to talk about Kubernetes topics, so excited to get into it today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people have heard of Kubernetes at this point, but I think it's worth just kind of um, doing a quick intro overview to it, both in case someone hasn't, and also to kind of get your perspectives. There's a lot of different ways to look at Kubernetes. So, you know, what is your view of Kubernetes? Sure. So the way I like to start out explaining Kubernetes is that it is a tool for running applications at scale. It provides a layer of abstraction over a number of machines or virtual machines, some unit of compute that you're actually going to be running your workloads on. But uh, the, the nice thing about the layer of abstraction that it provides is you can tell Kubernetes, hey, I want to run this application, and it'll figure out what unit of compute to actually run that on within its cluster. So that's why we talk about Kubernetes clusters. So. Another thing that makes Kubernetes so great for scale is that it has a lot of really nice management tools for managing these applications as they're running at scale. For example, say you have an application and you want to run three copies of it. You can tell Kubernetes that, and uh, you can do it in such a way that we call declarative. So you declare to Kubernetes, I want there to be three copies of this application running. And if something were to happen to one of those copies of the application, Kubernetes would automatically spin up a new one so that it's always in the right declared state that you've told it you want it to be in. So Kubernetes has these nice tools for managing applications at scale, and it provides a nice abstraction layer um, to effectively run applications at scale. Awesome. That, that helps a lot. And then, you know, I think from my perspective as kind of like somebody who's all in on virtual machines and, and the like, you know, I think of them as being really tightly related because Kubernetes, you know, is always running on on a I think usually a VM, but always on some kind of computer. Um, is that how you see it from the Kubernetes side? Like, are the, are these related or not? Yeah, I think that's something that folks often miss when they're starting to learn about Kubernetes is that it's really all units of compute, usually virtual machines, on the back end. But here with GKE, Google Kubernetes Engine, we actually have a couple of different modes. So your perspective as a user on how Kubernetes relates to virtual machines will be different depending on which of those modes you're using. So GKE standard mode is the way that we've been running Kubernetes since we've had a managed Kubernetes service for the last seven years as of August 2022. <laughs> so in standard mode, you have virtual machines backing your Kubernetes cluster. And your primary unit of cost for that GK cluster is those virtual machines that you've chosen to run as part of the cluster. You select their sizes, their types, how many of them, all of those types of things. And so that's really what makes up your cluster. But over the last seven years, we've learned a lot about how companies run Kubernetes clusters. And based on what we've learned, we've created this new mode of operation called GK Autopilot Mode, which we released in 2021. And GK Autopilot Mode is what we call nodeless Kubernetes. In Autopilot Mode, you're using Kubernetes just as you normally would. You use kubectl commands. You can run your applications just the same as normal, pretty much. But you don't have access to those virtual machines. You're not choosing the virtual machines that go into the cluster. You're letting the cluster automatically choose those for you. And your unit of cost is then uh, pods. So in autopilot mode, um, you don't really see the virtual machines. You don't interact with them. So it's less clear the, the relationship. But in standard mode, it's a very, very close relationship. God, yeah, I'm I'm much more used to standard mode. Actually, I I haven't done much with autopilot, so I'm used to seeing, you know, when you look in the compute engine list, there's a, kind of a whole list of nodes uh, created by Kubernetes, um, but no control plane because that's you know being handled by the, you know, by Kubernetes engine. Um, so I guess in this scenario, even those wouldn't show up. Um, so I guess in my mind, then. I, 
it seems like there's kind of three ways, you know, you might run Kubernetes on, you know, Compute Engine. It would be you know, completely up to you. You know, you do everything. So you run the control plane and all the nodes yourself, or you use Kubernetes Engine standard where the control plane is managed and the nodes are handled, but they're still visible. And then there's the newer autopilot where everything is kind of taken care of. Um, but you mentioned the pricing is different, you know, per pod. I'm, so I'm used to, you know, you pay for VMs when they're on, you know, regardless of how much they're used. And so there's optimizations to think about there, but like, it's this kind of reservation. Is that what we're talking about or is it something different? Yeah, so that's exactly what it's like in GK standard mode. You decide which virtual machines you want to use, and you basically have a reservation on those. So you're paying for those when you have them. But in autopilot mode, I mentioned this pay per pod concept. If you're familiar with serverless models, GK autopilot mode is like a step closer to serverless, though it's still Kubernetes. You're still using the Kubernetes API. Uh, any familiarity you have with that will still apply, which is a little bit different from a serverless model because there are things you can do there like running Kubernetes daemon sets where you run an application on every single node in the cluster. You can still do that in autopilot mode. So you're not going to see these virtual machines in your account. Um, but if you ran something like kubectl get nodes, you'd be able to see a little bit of information about the nodes that are actually running. But like you mentioned, the pricing model is different. You're not paying for those nodes. You're not deciding which nodes to run, so it wouldn't make sense for us to charge you just based on those. Instead, you're telling us, well, you're telling Kubernetes what workloads you want to run. So it's really, really important to set your uh, workload resource requests and limits for your Kubernetes workloads in autopilot mode, because that's how we determine how much compute and how, many, how much memory, how many resources you need for that workload, and that's what you're charged based on instead. Got it. So the, the actual kind of CPU and memory used buy those pods to make, you know, like a deployment work or things like that. Is that the right? Exactly. Yeah. It's a, like a more granular, granular type Got model. <laughs> um, that makes sense. And then uh, I guess my next question, you know, a little bit of context first, you know, I think a lot of the folks watching this series are kind of operating, you know, you know, large sets of VMs or maybe providing a platform for developers to work on. Um, but also, you know, a fair number of developers as well. Um, and like on the VMs, you kind of have to handle everything, right? And you, know, you get to handle everything, but you kind of have to. So there's that, you know, what does this look like um, from a Kubernetes standpoint? You know, at this point, there's a lot of, you have a lot of experience with it. What patterns are you starting to see with how the development experience looks like on Kubernetes? Yeah, this is such a common question from businesses that are looking to adopt Kubernetes. How is this going to change the day-to-day -day life of my developers? And there are three primary models that I see companies adopting when they're adopting Kubernetes in terms of how they affect their developers. And most large enterprises, large enough businesses, will have all three of these models somewhere within them. <laughs> um, though smaller organizations might stick to one or two. Um, but here are the three patterns. The first one is what we call local traditional development. Your developers do their development of applications locally. And then in terms of how those applications are run, they just throw it over a wall to someone else. <laughs> so they focus really on coding and making applications. But they don't really care about Kubernetes or anything involved with it. And it doesn't affect their day-to-day -day lives. So the second model the developers get a little bit closer. They're doing local app development, but they're also containerizing those applications. So the way that Kubernetes does this application management at scale is to have all of those applications running in containers. So containers are kind of a prerequisite for running things in Kubernetes. Um, so in this model, your development lifecycle changes a little bit because your app developers are still creating the applications, but they're also deciding how those applications will be run in containers. And then they're taking those containers with their applications and throwing those over a wall for someone else to run. Maybe they'll be running on Kubernetes, but from there, the developers don't really care. So then the third model is app developers working directly with Kubernetes. So in this case, they're writing code for applications. They're containerizing that code. And they're also thinking about how that code is going to run 
on Kubernetes. So they're doing things like writing YAML manifests. They need to understand things like Kubernetes deployments. Um, so there's a bit more that they need to understand about Kubernetes in that case. So you can see that there's kind of a, an increasing scale of how this affects developers' lives, depending on which pattern you choose. Absolutely. And so that makes me wonder, though, if you're seeing all, all three of these patterns, you know, how would you recommend people choose, you know, like between them? Like, what should their goal be? Yeah, it's very much an it depends question. <laughs> so it, it kind of makes me think of the, the DevOps model. If you've heard much about the DevOps kind of uh, movement, <laughs> I would say, uh, the concept behind DevOps is really a cultural one. So you've got your developers, you've got your operations, and the line in between them sometimes gets a little blurry as we saw through these different patterns. So DevOps is all about who's doing what in your organization. Where do those responsibilities fall in terms of which role does what? Um, so depending on how you work that out in your organization, how many people do you have with the different skills and how many people do you have kind of in that middle space might help determine which of these models you choose. And also, if you have a long history of running a certain type of application in a certain way, you're considering modernizing it, um, you might go from one to the other and over time kind of move towards a role or a, a model where your developers are more invo involved with Kubernetes. But you might start with just a smaller team yep. of folks who understand Kubernetes and, and do the yeah. wall thing. <laughs> so there's a few different ways this it could go. Like, um... <laughs> I guess, like all good things in software development, you know, both from a tech and a human side, like it, it depends. So, okay. Um, it depends. I think that may be true for my <laughs> next question as well. And I know I've got an opinion about this, but I'd like to hear your, your take and expertise on it. You know, lots of systems run on straight VMs and now a lot of things run on Kubernetes. How would you recommend people choose whether or not to use Kubernetes. Yeah, there's a lot of different kind of facets you can come at this question from. And I feel like it's a question that folks ask a lot and often don't get really clear answers to <laughs> because I think there's so many different perspectives to look at it from. Um, but I'll start with one that's close to, to my heart because I've been dealing with it lately. <laughs> so recently I was spinning up a game server um, just for me and my friends to play a game together. And a really common trend in game servers these days is to run them in containers. It's a really nice way to package the game server because it can include all of the stuff that the game server needs all in one convenient package and kind of how to spin that up uh, becomes a little bit easier. So I've already got a container for this game server. Me being a Kubernetes expert, you might think I would definitely run that in Kubernetes. But we're not talking about a problem of scale here. This is just one server for me and my friends to use to play a game together. I don't need all of the additional management capabilities and abstractions that Kubernetes provides. So I'm going to run that on a virtual machine. So that Kubernetes being a, a tool for scale is a really important thing to consider when you're considering Kubernetes versus compute, like virtual machines. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and we have a, um, I, I think you're probably aware of this, but just in case folks don't know, we, we have a um, a way to run just a single container on a VM. So straight from from the cloud console, if you go and you just give it a URL or an image, it'll start it up. Um, so yeah, I've definitely seen that. And I guess the other big scenario is that I've, I've seen where people are kind of deciding, maybe deciding to use the VM instead is, um, you know, where you've got uh, a lot of existing applications that are not in cloud, you know, maybe some of them are on Windows and that sort of thing. Um, things that chat with the registry a lot are not super compatible with containerization and, and maybe, you know, other state, that kind of thing. Um, so I've seen that show up. And then I guess the other one might be kind of large databases where you've got a, you know, pretty significant database that, um, you already know it's going to be, you know, up and high traffic and you want to treat it kind of different than the rest of the system. A lot of people seem to put that on a VM, even if the rest of the software is in Kubernetes. Yeah, I mentioned that containers are at the core of how Kubernetes does what it does. And the whole model of containerizing applications, often we think about microservices, though it doesn't necessarily have to be microservices, but running things really effectively in 
containers requires a different viewpoint than the way that we've been developing applications. So a lot of these more traditionally developed applications will be kind of weird once you start trying to move them into containers. I think databases are a great like example because um, it's totally possible to run a database in Kubernetes, but it requires you to separate your thinking about the database as an application and the data that you store in the database. So that's a really weird way to think about it for a lot of folks who've been doing that kind of work for a long time. So um, might consider other solutions. <laughs> if that's the if that's the thing. That makes sense. Um, thank you so much. This was like a really great overview of the, the space and kind of thinking around it. I, I hope folks are you know, ready, you know, whichever direction you're coming from, either add some VMs to your Kubernetes or, you know, add some Kubernetes skill to your, your kind of VM expertise. If, if folks are in that mode, kind of want to give things a try, what would you recommend? There's so many different ways to learn these days. So a few different ways. Um, for one, of course, there's the Google Cloud Tech channel on YouTube. Um, I also run a series called GK Essentials on our YouTube channel. So if you're ever looking for GK and Kubernetes information, we've got a variety of videos out there. I know that we do. <laughs> uh, we also have, if you like live webinar type learning, um, where maybe you can ask live questions while you're learning something or something like that, we have our Cloud on Air uh, webinar series. And I know I've done several of those on Kubernetes. We have um, GK and related topics on pretty regularly. And I'm sure that we have ones uh, ones about various compute options and things like that as well. So definitely check out the Cloud On Air webinar series. And if you want to get hands on, we have things like our Quick Labs um, solution for, for getting hands on with uh, tutorials, guided tutorials that teach you how to do things. Um, and if you want to get hands on in a less structured way, if you just want to play with Kubernetes, there's a couple things I'd recommend. For one, Minikube. So Minikube is a, an open source tool that's associated with the Kubernetes open source project. And it's for running a Kubernetes cluster locally, just a small cluster that you can play around on to get a sense for how Kubernetes works. And then if you want to learn about how to run things on Kubernetes and not about Kubernetes itself, <laughs> so running Kubernetes from scratch um, you might think is a great way to, to start learning things. And it is if you want to learn about how to run Kubernetes itself and how Kubernetes itself is built. Um, but if you want to learn how to run things on Kubernetes, you might want to skip that part and use a managed service like GKE, where the Kubernetes part is provided for you and you can just worry about running things on it and figuring out um, how that side of Kubernetes works. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And thank you very much. That's a, a very extensive list of things to try. We will get the links to those things down below. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to talk about Kubernetes and especially how it relates to compute. Like I said, I think that's something that people often miss when they're learning about Kubernetes. So I'm really glad we got to talk about that today. <laughs> Absolutely. And all of you folks who are like becoming or already are experts in Compute Engine, everything you know about that applies to, you know, these nodes that are running Kubernetes. So um, go, please give this stuff a try. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you for watching this far. And we will see you next time.